Jim. Welcome back. I must tell you, we have a problem with the phone lines. Apparently, so many people are calling in that you've jammed the lines. Don't worry, we're hoping to unblock them. Bear with us and keep calling. From now until quarter past 12, the clockwork orange. No, not the film or the book, but the perhaps more sinister reality. This week, the government admitted there was a propaganda operation in Northern Ireland called Clockwork Orange. And we've got with us Colin Wallace, the man who says he was part of it. Clockwork Orange was an intelligence services campaign of lies and smears aimed at hitting the terrorists. Well, Ken Livingston, I'd like to start with you and ask you, what's wrong with that sort of campaign? After all, terrorist groups like the IRA don't play it exactly clean. They've been bombing and maiming people for the last, what, 20 years in Northern Ireland? Of course not. You can't have a war without things going wrong, people stepping over the rules. And no one ever had a nice war. The two points that come out of this is, were some of those dirty tricks counterproductive? Did they win more support for um, the IRA than they actually undermined? And even if we could debate that all night, there's still no way you can justify MI5 officers and army intelligence officers using dirty tricks and black propaganda to smear their own chiefs. We had these people circulating literature suggesting that the then Prime Minister Edward Heath was homosexual. I mean, completely spurious and forged documents, doing um, similar dirty tricks on the deputy leader of the Labour Party, on Harold Wilson. These officers weren't fighting the IRA, they were fighting the elected government of the day, and it was an act of treason. Let's start with Northern Ireland first, though, because that is the first mm. part, if you like, of this Clockwork Orange campaign, um, operation. Are you saying that it was justified, then, and it was perfectly all right for that sort of campaign to be undertaken by people like Colin Wallace? No, because I think if you actually talk to people who were the, the soldiers fighting on the ground. They recognise that when we use the methods of the terrorists, of disinformation or assassination or sending our troops in, in um, civilian clothes over the border to let off bombs, you actually undermine your case. We, you expect a terrorist organisation to break the law, to kill, to maim innocent people. You do not expect a government supposed to be based on the rule of law to use their methods. As soon as you do that, you've lost there's no moral difference between the two sides. Miles Copeland used to be the head of the CIA in Britain. Do you agree <coughs> with what Ken Livingston is saying? Ken is talking nonsense and I suspect he knows it. Sure. Uh, <laughs> we, uh, he must remember that at this time when, the, when all these things happened, we were on a kind of war. Now, during World War II, we had people say we mustn't bomb Berlin because we'd be sinking to the level, we'd ju be just as bad as the Germans. Well, in 1970, we must remember Ken's not old enough to remember, but uh, at that time, uh, the KGB had, had doubled its operations. The Soviets had given up on nuclear war. I mean, we both sides knew that we were not going to have a nuclear war. We were stalemated in Europe. The Soviets knew, even though they had superior equipment, if they tried to attack us, to attack NATO, they'd wind up finding Czechs and Poles and everyone else. And so they quite wisely descended to, if you like, uh, what they called confrontations of the third kind. Small wars here and there, uh, Africa, Ireland and wherever. And the Leninist, the neo-Leninist strategy was not is that the Soviets did not bank on their strengths but on our weaknesses. Now a principal weakness was Ireland. And as a weakness we Americans were greatly concerned with because Irish Americans were helping the cause sure. and whatever. So when we all went into this together and believe me the British and the Americans are, are in the intelligence services rightly or wrongly I believe we have the same enemies. I mean, we have the same problem, same enemies, and so we, we exchange information, we work together on these things. What happens, however, is that once you have a secret operation where the whole principles of management are different than they are in, say, General Motors or U.S. Steel or whatever, you have compartmentalized need-to-know segments where it's very easy for one little section to use some personal grudge in order to go after someone they didn't like, like Ted Heath. Now, let me add one more thing. And that is that in all of these operations that we Americans knew about, they were not operations against any particular, certainly no cabinet ministers were involved, but members of the parliament or members of Congress in America. They were the ones who were caught on the side of some operation against a nuclear operation of the Soviets. Mm -hmm. Now, I forget how many MPs there are, but you must think that the Soviets are awfully dead. How many? Too many. Well, okay. <laughs> but you either think that this KGB is absolutely inactive well, and not doing anything, but or you've got to accept that they've got certain MPs that they have, in fact, recruited, and we now know that they've recruited. But, but the actual smears and lies and all the rest of it, Clockwork Orange, in, in the first stage, that was okay. That's part and parcel of that sort of war 
against terrorism. Let me oh, wait, wait, let me add one more thing. No, well, very brief. Well, yeah, I'll make, I make this brief. I, for one, I was the first, probably the first person in the CIA who got into this dirty tricks business. They weren't as dirty as a lot of people yeah, think. Yeah, because a lot of people find it very objectionable. But it wasn't just a minute. It's a, to, to, to blacken someone is a hell of a lot better than killing him. In World War II, we killed people. <laughs> and in now, when we got into business, well, we were simply playing dirty tricks to, to prevent having World War III. And Some people might prefer to be dead than <laughs> smeared so horribly as it appears, according to Ken Livingston, that they have been. But Colin oh, was, Ken mean you're, you're the man that sparked all this <laughs> off now, and you're the man at the centre of it all. Well, tell, what's, what are sort of things are we talking about? Cause, well, is it just this sort of idea of sitting down with a journalist and sort of wink, wink, nudge, nudge, did you know that you know, so-and-so might be this, that and the other? What are we talking about? Oh, I think there's a wide range of activities uh, at the very bottom end of the scale if the IRA rob a bank and they disappear off with £5,000. You go along to the journalist and say they stole £10,000. And this is what you would do, is it? That's right, because then the leadership of the IRA would say, where's the other 5000 <laughs> And And, um, and this, what was this? Was this to subvert within the IRA to make them no, feel I, uncomfortable that's right, as an organisation? That's right, because the idea is you've got to destabilise the terrorists, and you've also got to try and make them believe they've got informers in their own ranks, so that you upset their own planning procedures. But I, again, I think there's a big difference between that type of operation, I would agree with, with Miles Copeland, um, as opposed to the attempts to overthrow a democratic elected government, because that's what the IRA are trying to do. And our job as security forces was to beat the terrorists, not actually help them do the, the job they were trying so to do. So what made you change your mind? Because it, uh, presumably at the beginning you were very happy to do all this, weren't you? Well, yes, I grew up in Northern Ireland. I believed that um, terrorism, either from the right or the left, was the enemy at the time. I did not uh, join the security forces to discredit the Labour Party, the Conservative Party, the Liberal Party. And because I was deflected from my main job into doing political disinformation, I was not actually doing the job I joined to do. So what sort of <coughs> political disinformation did you get involved in? Uh, basically, we were passing around uh, forged documents, including forged CIA identity cards, which didn't actually exist. <laughs> Dirty dog. <you> know. <laughs> the, the, and these, these, were, what, uh, these were senior people in Northern Ireland, was this related yes, to? Yes, and, uh, and the mainland as well? No, including Northern Ireland politicians, where we had forged bank accounts, we had election literature from the Labour Party saying that um, they were very friendly to the North Vietnamese at the time when uh, Kennedy and Nixon was trying to knock the stuffing out of Ho Chi Minh. So in other words, you were trying to show the, uh, the Labour Party in a bad light. And the sort of thing that Ken's been talking about, the uh, specific smearing of Wilson, of Ben, of, of other people, were you, did you know of that? Were you involved in yes, that? Yes, well, what happened really was that uh, that information was supplied to me from London but it was designed to be set in the context of a homosexual scandal in Belfast. And at that time, of course, the world's press were covering the Northern Ireland Troubles. And this was an ideal platform to disseminate the information too. But I withdrew from the operation in September 74, just before the general election, as part of my dispute over the misuse of intelligence. And that's really how this row all started. So c when, so I know, t I know that yesterday, for example, Dale Campbell Savers, one of Labour's MPs, stood up and said, this has been said, uh, supposedly by a Labour MP, at a conference that actually never took part. Is that, does this ring a bell with you? Uh, is, are these are examples that Ken <coughs> have given. Can you, can you confirm them? Can you say yes? That's a piece of information which I saw come from MI5 or wherever and which I gave out. Yes, the one I can confirm was the one that Merlin Rees had, um, which um, listed various politicians attending a, a Bloody Sunday commemoration service. In fact, what happened was we got an original leaflet, uh, we blanked out some of the names and we inserted the politicians into it. Um, but there were others, there was a forged bank account belonging to Ian Paisley, uh, where he was buying uh, land in Canada and things like that. Barry Cam, you, you've known Colin Wallace. Yes, for a very long time. Sure. To, be, to be blunt, can we trust him? I mean, with respect, Colin Wallace, you're the sort of chap that spread lies in the past. Why should we believe him now? Well, I think there's one important thing to remember in all of this. These documents may have been produced by Colin and others, <coughs> smearing individuals, smearing organisations. But the important thing to remember is all those documents that Dale Campbell Sabres waved in the House of Commons this week were never published because any responsible journalist in Northern Ireland in the early 70s knew what Colin Wallace was up to. There was this gung-ho character who was running around at dead of night shoving envelopes full of documents into the letter boxes of journalists and Colin would meet you at army headquarters and say, oh, by the way, do you know that Ian Paisley is mixing with a man who's a known homosexual? And you'd say, there's Colin's at it again. 
So in a sense, the black propaganda campaign. Yeah, the black propaganda campaign. The popular press wouldn't print. Well, all I'm saying to you is, I mean, Colin had some. Colin had some very notable successes. I mean, Colin got into a newspaper in Britain, the story of exploding knickers. And that was at about the level at which this black this propaganda... This must have been yeah. the sun. This must have been no, the sun. Do you want me to tell you the story? <coughs> well, It's uh, a useful story to well, understand well, how they yes, did it. Yes, do, because we At a certain period of time it, in so the 70s, a number of young women were going into public buildings with explosive devices concealed within inside them, would you believe? Colin concocted a story that these devices could be prematurely exploded by static in nylon knickers. <laughs> now what that achieved yes, was, a lot I've of little this. girls in West Belfast were wetting their knickers for a few weeks, but only one newspaper actually took that story up and published it, and when he published it, he knew it was a lie. Yeah. But I think the but specific I, point I is... That in yes. Lurgan, two ladies were destroyed by carrying explosives into a public lavatory in the market square on the and yeah. after that story came out for what it's worth it didn't occur again in Ireland. Fred Holroyd, I mean, you, be bad. You, this is the, I think this is another key point because you were involved in running agents both north and south of the border. The sort of things that we're talking about were they justified if they stopped innocent people or soldiers being murdered and killed? Well I agree with Ken Livingstone that if you're fighting for law and order against terrorism and you are reduced to using terrorism to fight the terrorists, then what, in, what on earth are you fighting for? What on earth are you trying to uphold? If you've become terrorist yourself, they've won. Oh, because yeah. you're using exactly oh, the same tricks as them. It happened to America. Anthony Bowen, is that you right? Must, you must look at the history books. I mean, All ministry history shows that when forces of law and order have resorted to terrorist tactics, in the end they have lost. That is the issue, isn't it? Well, there's two issues here. Uh, first of all, of course, you always get disinformation in any kind of war, as, as, my, as my friend here has just said. But if you take the case of Mr. Wallace here, um, Tom King and the Prime Minister had no reason to protect anybody because they're not personally implicated. So in, in the Wallace case, as it's now true. become, uh, they have a, all they're concerned with is that the proper fact should be known. This new information was laid before Parliament, not at anybody's request, except at Tom King and the Prime Ministers, so that the truth should be known. Well, he's been the, banging on oh, about hold it for on, donkeys. Hold on, hold on. Indeed he has. Mr. C Mr. Colcott is sitting on an inquiry into the Wallace case, and I, and, and I think it should be said that uh, I would rather trust Tom King and the Prime Minister's view of things than as he, as Mr. Wallace has rightly, be, as Mr. Wallace has rightly been called gung-ho, which is why in 1975 he could either resign or be sapped. And in 1981, charged with murder, subsequently dropped to manslaughter for which he got 10 years in jail and Paul Foot, as ever backs anybody in the world to try to say that he was framed but, but this and all issue, this is a uh, subterfuge to be absolutely blunt so that as everybody else who's ever convicted uh, of any crime poor Mr Wallace was rubbish. framed but, I don't but believe but he was framed the point that it's he a made. fact it's a fact let my dear is, chap yeah, let, 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 let me tell you some fact. Fact. Oh, hell. Jonathan Lewis was murdered wearing a suit. He normally wore casual clothes. He was a medallion man. That day, he took a suit from the cleaners he that had got, been oh, no, 10 no, years no, no, in jail. I can prove that. No, 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 I stop you there. I can prove that there is evidence that shows that Colin Wallace was well, not committed to that No, no, just a minute, both of you. We're not, dis we're not discussing. It's very no, just important a minute, Tony. to the we are not. Whooshed. We are not discussing. <laughs> <laughs> We're not discussing that. The issue which this gentleman yeah, raised no. and Mr Wallace raised was whether or not it was right to conduct a campaign with as dirty hands as the people that you're trying to fight. And he says, once you do that, you sink to their level. That's the issue. It's like we bombing that. Berlin. When we bomb Berlin, it's we're sinking like to the German level. That's right. Yeah. That is the issue. Is it Terrible. right to do it? Because according to, to Tom, to well, according to Tom King, around. it's still going on. We would have lost the Second World War, as Miles Copeland says, if we hadn't bombed Berlin while they were bombing 
Birmingham and Coventry. So it's right, it is right to, to do the sort you of thing. You fight fire with fire quite often. Right. Right. You fight right. with Up in the back there, just with the red tile. There's a, a conflict of interest here. There's someone in the House of Commons who's stopping an inquiry into this, and that person happens to be the major beneficiary out of this affair, who's Margaret that? Thatcher, mm. well, how, who's how stopping a wide ranging wait? inquiry into this affair so that we all the public can judge what the situation is and what the true facts are well, in Why this is she case. a beneficiary of that? Well, she, no, no, she, no, had a meteoric, she had a meteoric uh, rise through the Tory party from an unknown minor minister uh, during this period when smears were going out uh, against mostly Labour Party politicians, uh, some Liberals yes, and yes, some wet Conservatives. No, yes, of course it is. Now let him answer it. should be answered. The great period which this covers is between 1973 and 1975. The Conservatives came to power in 1979. Even your perverted logic can't be. Oh, but that's not true. true. <laughs> that is not true. <laughs> Perspective, yeah. shall we? That's ridiculous. Well, Lord, while we're discussing what dirty tricks we play, the IRA are still killing and murdering yeah, innocent yeah. people, yeah, yeah. and Mr. Livingston is quite prepared to back them. So Why can't Mr. Livingston yeah. condemn the Sinn Féin yeah. for backing Well, we're not people? asking him to. What yeah. we're asking to find uh, if, out is he's actually said that he doesn't think this is the let best me, way me, to Let, let me clear them. that point. Oh. I, I condemn, shh, shh, I you condemn you every... We don't hear anybody. Go I on. condemn every act of violence, whoever does it. I make no exceptions to that. What we're being told here isn't true, though. When Tony Beaumont Dark talks about who was in power here, then, and now, those, that's not the issue. The thing that's damaging to Thatcher, and why she's set this very narrow inquiry, is that her closest friend and associate, the man who ran her leadership campaign, met with Peter Wright after talking to these traitorous MI5 officers, approached her, Airy 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 approached Airy her to Airy. run for the Tory leadership, was her closest friend and advisor throughout that period, and was in this up to his neck. Mrs. Thatcher doesn't want an inquiry because it leads to the outer office of the, door, or of the, the leader of the opposition throughout that period. And we're asked to believe that her closest friend and advisor never once indicated her anything that was going on. She took no efforts yeah. to stop it. This is outrageous. And if that is not the case, is is then we have to ask, why was she so unaware of what her Let main friend sentence, and advisor was doing? Me and too. why even a week before he was assassinated himself, was he meeting with former MI6 officers to set up an illegal group to take action against right, the left you, wing of the Labour Party? Tony Bounder has got to I'm answer that. I'm <laughs> You've got to answer Ken that Livingston one. has said things like this before. He believes in the conspiracy theory of politics because no, he, lo no, he no. loves that kind of thing. It is quite outrageous. Airy Neve was, was blown up and killed in the House of Commons by the IRA. He was an honourable man who'd served throughout the war with great distinction in this country. One of the people who saved us so that we could be here tonight discussing any problem, including the Irish problem. And all the evidence so court evidence is purely anecdotal. I am sick and tired of people like Ken Livingstone pouring scorn upon people who he isn't worthy to clean their shoes. <laughs> Absolutely, uh, it's absolutely untrue, unfounded, and let him produce the evidence well, if he's got. the letters to Colin Wallace in Airy Neve's own hands. Ten right. years in prison for manslaughter against Airy Neve. Don't you smears? Right, let me ask these people in the audience. Ask where right. the letters came from. It's true. Right, gentlemen, one moment. You two have been dying to get in. Yeah. You first with the grey. Well, I think it's. Uh, quite amusing that this is one of the uh, people that represent our country when all he can resort to is um, personal abuse and personal insults to the other people it's in the... It's not personal abuse. You're saying he's not going to lift someone's shoes. You're, you're, what do you want to say? Um, I think the fact that there's a large debate in the Commons yesterday and Mr King incredibly claimed that neither he nor Mrs Thatcher knew anything about these claims whatsoever. Um, who, if she's leader of the party and the government, who is officiating no, all these uh, policies? Yes. Well, well, do you think that Thatcher knew? There was no evidence. Let's ask Colin Wallace. Do you, do you think well, that Thatcher knew? Sorry, first of all, listening to the debate, in fact, um, I come very low on the propaganda scale from what I've just listened. Um, <laughs> in 19... <laughs> first first of, true, then? In um, 1975, long before Peter Wright surfaced, or indeed Harold Wilson made his claims, I had a briefing with my London solicitors on the smear campaign, he and I went to see a Labour junior minister, gave him the full details, and I also wrote to Harold Wilson. So that's long before any of this became public. Secondly, on the 1st of November 1984, I sent a complete file of my allegations, including those relating to the Concora Vice scandal, 
to the Prime Minister personally. To this day, I have not been uh, interviewed, nor have any of the officers serving with me in Northern Ireland been interviewed by any government body. Yes. Look, I think there's a key issue here. The fact that this inquiry is so limited means that the Colin Wallace bandwagon is up and running again. Aye. And what the public will, will, will believe, right or wrong, is if Colin Wallace has found the government <laughs> to be wrong in one thing, then, he can th then his entire allegations stand. And I know for a fact that a number of the allegations when Colin Wallace was getting desperate for attention in the 80s simply do not hold water. So unless there's a full inquiry, and unless everything that Colin alleges is looked into, then it is the public who suffers. Tony, yeah, this, is, this yes. is the point, isn't it? No, there's two things. Because we didn't believe him before, uh, no, and it I, turns out no, that he was I right. Why don't we believe him now? No, I agree with our friend here. There's two things that can arise out of this. There is the Colcott inquiry, which the government set up to answer some of the allegations of this gentleman here. And the second thing is that the House of Commons has a way of its own, if it wishes to take it, through either the, the Defence Select Committee or the Home Affairs Select Committee but to investigate these But why don't we have a big matters. public inquiry no, into the whole thing? No, well, because frankly, you get the conspiracy theory again instead of the well, cock-up theory of politics, that every time somebody like Mr Wallace or anybody else cries stinking fish, we either have to have royal commissions or committees set up. And I think that's wrong. I think that's wrong. Yeah. Let me uh, Miles, very briefly, my love. And you, you dig up a lot of things that you didn't want to dig up, which have nothing to do with whether people misbehaved or not. They're matters of national security. People this is only so, the in other words, the government's oh, frightened hey, of a hey, public hey, inquiry. Okay. <laughs> but the, so the government's well, frightened. What's wrong with national, national security? What's wrong with national security, Ken? Well, Give Ken the last word. How does it help national security to have MI5 officers smearing Edward Jesus? No, I didn't say that. Wait a minute. Nobody said that. 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 Nobody said that.